How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah? So, as the name suggested, today we're going to be talking about uh, developing a social model for autism. So, how many of you have experience either being yourself an autistic or knowing an autistic? All right. All right. Good. Good. So, we're going to start out by talking about... Um, this is my dog, Sylvia. This is my service dog. We'll uh, talk a little bit about her later. Uh, she's getting comfortable. Sylvia, down. <laughs> she's retiring soon, so she's, she's kind of at that point where she's like, yeah, just get through the day. We're good. <laughs> Sylvia, hey, hey, down. All right, so anyways, as she said, I'm Nathan. I'm a graduate student here at UNI. Uh, I'm a YouTube activist for autism and uh, disability rights. So today is about laying out the models of disability and arguing for a social model specifically of autism. So we're going to start out by laying out those models historically. This is sort of an introductory type of uh, basic idea. So uh, throughout history, there have been three main models of disability. There's been the moral model, the medical model, and the social model. So let's discuss the moral model. The moral model is the idea that disability derives from some kind of moral failure. So basically, if someone has a disability, it's either because they are a part of a society that has committed some kind of sin or that they themselves have committed some kind of sin. Uh, looking all the way back to the Dark Ages, this has been the most prominent model of disability discourse that has been prevalent throughout the course of history. So going back to the Dark Ages, um, the founder of Lutheranism, Martin Luther, and uh, Calvinism, uh, Calvin, they both believed that disability, a disabled child, is possessed by demons. And therefore, the only way to fight against that demonic possession is to basically kill them at birth. Kind of a scary thought. But then there was another approach to it. The other approach to it was take care of the people. Take care of the people with disabilities, because they derive not from their own personal failings, but from some kind of failing in society. Therefore, it is a punishment from some kind of divinity for society's moral failings. And in order to make up for it, they're sent down as a test. So you need to take care of them. So that's the moral model. So next we have the medical model. And this arguably is the most prominent one in the United States today. So the medical model is the idea that Disability does not derive from some kind of moral problem. It derives instead from some kind of scientific abnormality. It's the scientific luck of the draw, or bad luck of the draw, as some might put it. Now, this has some improvements, certainly, from the moral model, in that it states that uh, we should not blame people for their disabilities. Instead, the ultimate goal is to treat disability as if it is some kind of medical condition. So there are two approaches to this. There is person-focused, so focusing on helping the individual overcome those abnormalities. And the second one is more of a societal focus. And this is the darker side of the medical model basically eugenics. So eugenics being the idea that we need to genetic, that we need to protect the genetic purity of society. And therefore, people with disabilities, it's not your fault, but you can't reproduce. Because that creates more offspring that is forced to live with a disability. So that's the medical model. Finally, we have the social model, which is what we're going to be talking about mainly today and what we're going to be building up to today. 
The social model is the idea that disability comes not from a moral failing, not even from a medical abnormality, but from society. Society is built up of people without disabilities, which makes that disabling. So what do we mean when we say that? We mean, uh, take left-handed, left-handedness, for example. How many people in here are left-handed? Would you describe yourself as disabled? No. Does it feel like a challenge, though? Because right now you live in a society where you have to write from left to right, and it would be a lot easier to write from right to left. You have to kind of curl your hand around to get it correctly. There's nothing inherently disabling about being left-handed. It's the fact that we live in a society that is built for right-handed people that makes it a struggle. So the social model also has some advantages to it. There have been various studies that have indicated that people that tend to follow a more social model approach tends to be more likely to support disability rights legislation. And we'll get more to that later. So we've laid out the models. And the next part is I would like to tell you my own story, my process through these models, how I went from having a moral model approach to a medical model approach, and now a social model approach. It was quite a journey, and we're going to be talking about each model individually and how they impacted my life. And then we're going to discuss specifically how we can work to create a world that values the social model. So this goes back to when I was a wee lad. I was 10 years old. I was in fifth grade, right before middle school. I had no idea what was about to happen to me. I should have enjoyed elementary school when I had it. but. There I was. I had been bullied a lot. It started getting really bad in fourth grade, and it was still pretty bad in fifth grade. And one day, I was feeling really depressed. I did not want to go to school. And my mother, who is one of the most amazing people I know, my mother sat me down. You know, she asked me what was wrong. I told her I don't feel like I belonged. I told her that no one seems to understand anything about me. No one seems to understand how my brain works. I feel like an outsider. And I could almost see some, some struggle in her face when I told her this, as if she was trying to decide, should I tell him? And she decided to. She said, Nathan, this is not some kind of thing that you do incorrectly. This is because you have Asperger's. And when I first heard that, my first thought was, oh my god, my mom just said, ass! <laughs> my second thought was, I like burgers. Mom didn't cuss very often. Um, so she explains to me what that meant. She said that it is a disorder that causes you to sometimes have trouble with eye contact, have sensory overload, you know, have problems with sensory receptors. Many people with Asperger's are very smart and intelligent, but they don't understand social cues. And you know what? At the time, that was pretty comforting to have a name for it. But at the same time, I finally had something to hate. I finally had a word to blame for everything, every time something went wrong. I was able to look at that and say, I have been punished with Asperger's, and I can blame it on Asperger's. And so, I embraced the moral model. I mean, 
I didn't know I was at the time. I hadn't actually done this research about each of the models. But for all intents and purposes, I was following a moral model approach because I was seeing it as some kind of punishment. And every time I would do something that was ASPE related, that would get me into trouble, I would turn around and be like, that was my, that was my fault. That was my problem. So one, one story that goes along with this, and if you're in my class, you might have heard this. When I was in sixth grade, which might have been the worst year of my life, as it is for a lot of people, because it's middle school, I really liked a girl. I mean, as much as a sixth grader can. But I had a major crush on this girl. And she knew it. I had told her several times. And throughout the year, I had kind of been talking on and off with her about it. And she was never really giving me any clear indications. And because I was autistic, I couldn't take the hint. And so one day I was talking to her on the phone, and I said, and she asked me if there were any girls that I had a crush on. And I was like, yes, one. And she was like, you should ask her out. And, and at the time, I kind of I kind of didn't know what that meant. Like, I didn't know the sacred bond of going up to a girl and asking them out, or going up to a boy and asking them out, and that sacred type of social connection that magically occurs when someone says yes. In fact, I still don't. <laughs> but I wanted to. I wanted to understand. So I said, how do you go about doing something like that? And she said, put a love note in her locker. And then she told me her locker number. And I still remember it to this day. One of the gifts and curse of having a really good autistic memory. And so the next day, I wrote a letter, put it in her locker, and I said in it, and these were my exact words, again, I remember them even all these years later, it said, thank you for giving me advice on how to ask you out. You're pretty and smart. Will you agree to be my girlfriend? Yeah. My mother thought it was adorable. <laughs> so, next day I put it in her locker, and I just kind of wait. It was quite possibly some of the most uh, nerve-wracking moments of waiting that I've ever had. And so after lunch, I see that she's gathered half of sixth grade around her. And I'm like, oh, damn it. This isn't going to go well. She runs up to me, and she screams at the top of her lungs, no, several times. I'm pretty sure she also threw the note at me, but at some point I kind of blacked out due to embarrassment. And I didn't see it coming. And at the time, I thought, if I were normal, if I weren't this cursed individual, Maybe I would have seen that coming. And I hated myself for it. My parents picked me up. They could tell that she had said no by the fact that my eyes looked like the Atlantic Ocean. I told them what happened. And they were there for me. But it was still a moment in my life of extreme disappointment in myself. So then, a miracle happened at the end of this year. This dog. You see, I had been working with my therapist for a while about understanding how the neurotypical mind works. For those of you that don't know what a neurotypical is, that's basically what autistics 
called non-autistics. Kind of like uh, monkeys. <laughs> so I've been talking to my therapist about basically how to understand neurotypicals, how to navigate in a neurotypical world. And for a while, she, uh, she was extremely helpful. And for a while, she was thinking, you know what might really help Nathan? A service dog. There had been a new development among service dogs. They had been starting to be used to help with autism. And uh, dogs were always my favorite animals. When I, would go to, when I would go to my grandmother's house for days upon end, I wouldn't get homesick. I would get dog sick. I missed my dogs. When I would come home from school, I would kick off my shoes and get with my dog. Because that was my comfort. So when my therapist brought up the idea that you might, what would you think about having a dog that you can take everywhere? I was like, these exist? <laughs> Who thought of this? Where have they been? Uh, so I was really excited. I was really excited about this. So we applied to this organization called Susquehanna Service Dogs. They're in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And, um, and we went to a few meetings, and we went to these meet the dog sessions where they would basically have me interact with other dogs, dogs that are done with their training. And they would, they would see how I interacted with them. And on the second one, I met a certain yellow Labrador who, the first thing she did when she came out was jump on my lap and lick me in the face. And I thought, I like this dog already. I was a very energetic kid. I needed a very energetic dog. She used to have a lot more energy. <laughs> we kind of grew up together, so you know. So, I was selected with Sylvia, and I actually had to take off the last week and a half of school in order to go to this training program. I had to go through team training with the dog, where they would basically teach me how to handle her and teach her how to handle me. The latter is a lot more difficult. And on that last day, because I had to take the last week off, I told my class, that I wouldn't be there for the last week. And they cheered. They cheered because they wouldn't have to deal with me. So it goes. For any Kurt Bonnie fans. So that was very hurtful. But it's kind of interesting is that that was actually the last extremely hurtful thing that an entire class ever did to me. Because when I got Sylvia, the change was like that. I was suddenly happy about going to school. I was suddenly appreciating teachers. I was developing relationships. And at this point, I started changing my view of autism. I didn't blame myself for it, finally. I thought, this is just some kind of genetic abnormality. And because it's a genetic abnormality, it can be treated. And this is my treatment. It's not my fault. And so I started telling people that. When I would have issues in class, I would say, I'm sorry. It's because I'm autistic, or it's because I'm an Aspie. And people were finally starting to understand that. There's actually one girl who the previous year had bullied me a lot. Like, she would be there uh, when I was waiting for my father to come pick me up, and she would just bully me while I was waiting for it. And this next year, I talked to her. She asked me about Sylvia. I told her about Sylvia. 
and she apologized for how she treated me. And later that year, she drew a picture of Sylvia and me. Wrote, Sylvia plus Naquin, not Naquin, wow. <laughs> Sylvia plus Nathan equals heart. And she gave it to me as a gift. Suddenly, I wasn't this moral failure. I was simply disabled. A medical condition that can be treated. And so I embraced that. I embraced that idea. And still wasn't really proud of it, but I couldn't really hide it. I mean, when you walk around with a service dog, it's kind of hard to hide the fact that you're disabled. Kind of lost anonymity, which is nice because I love attention. But at the time, it was a little bit difficult because I didn't like attention on that issue. So things kept moving along. I was happy under the medical model. And then something happened. So let me just let me just back up for a sec. My embracing my embracement of the medical model was so strong, I actually gave uh, I, I had an aunt who passed away, who was blind, and I actually gave a speech about person-first language um, as a eulogy to basically talk about how she didn't let her disability define her. For those of you that don't know person-first languages, that's when uh, you put the person before the disability. So you say person with autism instead of autistic. We'll get more to that later. But then something happened. I was in a life skills class, and there is an individual there who was autistic, who was talking to me, and I was talking to him. I don't remember what we were talking about. But a guy in the classroom comes up to me and says, don't worry about him, he's autistic. Basically, as a you know, I'm sorry that he's bothering you. He's autistic. So don't worry about him. And then I was kind of taken aback. I was like, well, so am I. You got a problem with that? And then he said, no, I mean, like, he's retarded. And I thought about it for a sec. It's a very strong word. I've been called that my whole life. Some by people that were uh, directly trying to offend me because I was autistic. Sometimes it was just people that use it casually. But it's a powerful word. And it usually hurt to hear that. And it did this time. But I was in fighting mode. And I thought about how the word simply means slow. The word retard means slow. And I am slow. It technically does apply to autism on a functional level. Now, obviously, on a connotation level, it's a very offensive thing to go around calling people. But in that moment, I was like, you know what? Yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. And so I told him, you know what? I'll own that word too. You got a problem with that. And suddenly he had no idea what to say. He backed off. And I realized that for once in my life, I finally came to understand autism not as not as something that I have, but something that I am. Something that constitutes my identity. And the build up to this was preceded by a lot of, uh, a lot of instances in which I had benefits 
because I was autistic. So we talked about the autistic memory. Well, eventually I started doing theater. And between eighth grade and ninth grade, I went to a, I, I tried out for a play, it was Alice in Wonderland. I was the Mad Hatter, had a huge hat. Um, still a picture of me wearing the suit. That was a lot of fun. And I used this opportunity to basically teach myself how to socialize through theater. Like I would see what makes good theater and I would apply that to real life. So what I did was I sat down and just watched the other people acting. Because most of them were a lot better than me at this point. I was still pretty young. And I memorized the entire play very quickly. And one day, there was a, uh, the, the person who was playing the caterpillar, one that smokes the hookah. Love that name, hookah. The caterpillar wasn't there. So they needed someone to fill in their lines. And this was early in it. So I volunteered. I said, I'll fill in the lines. And I was able to do her lines off script before she was able to do her lines off script. And that wasn't in spite of being autistic. That was because of being autistic. You see, I'm sure people have heard the trope that uh, you only use 10% of your brain. Yeah, that's BS. Every part of the brain is active. Every part of the brain wants to be doing something. So when some parts of the brain aren't doing something, or at least something that is considered neuronormal, it does other things. And it gives the person special skills, special abilities. In my case, it was memory. Fast forward a little bit. I joined the speech team in uh, my freshman year of high school. I was given a piece on Thursday. I had it memorized by Monday. It was 10 minutes of just me speaking. And I did it for the speech coach. And there was one moment where one of the people on the speech team actually turns to him after they watch me perform it, and she says, wait, when did he get this piece? And, the speech, and my speech coach looked at her and said, Thursday. And she just kind of looked at me in awe. And that was one of the first times that the skill associated with autism that I had was being celebrated by someone that wasn't my mother. <laughs> So that brings us to this moment, this moment where I heard a word that is supposed to break me, a word that is supposed to push you down, a word that is supposed to make you hate yourself, and I embraced it. I no longer identify as a person with autism. I identify as an autistic. Although autism isn't every part of who I am, it's a major part of who I am. I would not be me without it. If I could take some kind of pill and poof, no longer autistic, I wouldn't do it. Because that is part of what made me who I am. And as I went through the years, I was able to utilize those skills in order to be successful in my own field. I was a national finalist in speech in high school. I was a national semifinalist in several national level tournaments my senior year of college. And 
Now, I'm a graduate student at a university with an assistantship. I'm teaching a class in communication. <laughs> I have a disability that affects my ability to communicate, and I teach people communication. <laughs> I, I, I was almost afraid to mention that in the interview, but it was kind of hard to hide because there was a dog right there. <laughs> There's got to be something. So, that is my journey to embracing the social model. Now, to be clear, the social model isn't to say that there aren't things that are inherently disabling about autism. I have trouble with sensory. I have trouble with loud noises. I have trouble with certain fabrics. Ask, ask my mother, ask my fiance. Shopping with me is a pain in the butt. Like, it often takes trying on six different pairs of jeans before we can find one that I don't immediately rip off myself. But at the same time, there are things about it that can make up for now, obviously, there are different levels of autism. There's a spectrum. However, I wouldn't call it a hierarchical, hierarchical spectrum. You know, a lot of people would classify me as high-functioning autistic. But here's the issue with that. A lot of things that are associated with low-functioning autism, maybe a lack of verbal ability, can sometimes be made up in other areas. For example, I once met a kid who had nonverbal autism, and although he couldn't communicate verbally, he did clamation. Clamation. And he created beautiful work with it. Stuff that I couldn't even, I couldn't even try to do. Like, if anybody's ever seen me try to draw a picture, it's not a pretty thing. And ask the students in my class, me trying to draw on that board, it's, uh, my stick figures don't even look like sticks. <laughs> but no, this individual had this superior skill. And he had it not in spite of his autism, but because of it. So what's our path forward? How do we create a social model of autism? Well, several levels. First off, making sure on a societal level that we're supporting organizations that allow, that view autism not as a disease, but as an identity. Which means letting us speak for ourselves. I don't know. Who in here has heard of the organization known as Autism Speaks? <laughs> I heard some chuckles. Uh, I have a lot of problems with them. The first problem is that they only have two actual autistics on their board of directors. Call yourself an autism advocacy organization. Don't hog the mic. And don't call yourself Autism Speaks. Call yourself Speaking for Autism. Or something like that. Another problem with them is that they, uh, they embraced curism for a while. The idea that autism is a disease to be cured. We need to get rid of it. And here's the issue with that. First off, there's the, uh, the medical model versus social model issue, where you're basically saying that it's a condition, it's not an identity. Therefore, you're not marginalized, you're not oppressed, you're just disabled. And second off, autism is technically a genetic condition. So there's only one real cure for autism. 
And I don't think I need to say the word again. So supporting organizations like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Their motto is nothing about us without us. They're about both making sure that autism is looked at as a marginalized condition. They're about giving voices to people on the spectrum. And also they're about giving support to people on the spectrum. As in figuring out ways of helping with the sensory relief that autistics desperately need. Another good organization is the Autism Women's Network. Women's Network. So knowing the right organizations to look at in order to embrace a medical, a, a social model of autism. Next, being, being advocates ourselves. Figuring out the experiences of people on the spectrum. Now this isn't to say you meet an autistic on the street, say, hi, I hear you're autistic. Tell me your story. That gets annoying after a while. But if someone is offering their story, listen. There are lots of people on the internet that offer their stories. There are lots of people out there that want to tell you about their own autism experience. So listen. Let them be in charge, let us be in charge of our own movement. Next, embracing neurodiversity. Neurodiversity, the celebration of the unique view that autistics have on the world. In effect, it can even be broader than that. It doesn't, neurodiversity doesn't necessarily have to mean autism. It can be lots of neurological disabilities. Now, I can only speak from the point of view as an autistic, but letting people speak for themselves. You see, we're at a point in which we have the potential to shift the national conversation from one of pity to one of acceptance from one of tolerance to one of embracement. So during April, don't say Autism Awareness Month, say Autism Acceptance Month. Make sure that you become advocates. And make sure that you understand practicing allyship. Because there are people throughout this country that are living in a similar, they're, they're, have, they're in a similar part of their childhood that I was, who are ashamed of themselves. And they don't deserve that. They deserve to look at each other in the mirror every day and celebrate their own unique look on the world. And it starts here. It starts with people using their voices, using their words, and using love for your fellow humans. So, another thing that, another potential solution we can look at, right now, there is a bill in the United States House of Representatives called H.R. 620, the ADA Education and Reform Act. It is scheduled to be voted on this Thursday. And it basically dismantles the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So for those of you that don't know how the Americans with Disabilities Act is currently enforced, it is enforced through a system of complaints rather than direct oversight. So to put that into perspective, the health inspector comes by to McDonald's every now and then to make sure that they don't have dead rats in their kitchen. This 
would be like if instead of that, the only time anything happens is if one of the customers sees a dead rat and complains to the Justice Department. The Justice Department waits a year, gets back to them, says, all right, we'll send over a mediation person to talk to you about how to remove that dead rat. And then they sit down, talk to each other, try to remove the dead rat. If the mediation doesn't work out, you go to court over the dead rat. And then there's a big lawsuit. And the whole thing lasts two years because someone saw a dead rat. That's how the current system is. I actually went through this system at one point. I got kicked out of a restaurant because of my service dog. And it took a year for the situation to be resolved. So this law would basically add another 180 days to that and prolong the process, making it much harder for that enforcement to happen. This is a very clear moral model approach where we are blaming the, dis the people with disabilities for their situation, portraying them as the bad guys. The argument for this is frivolous lawsuits. It's a bunch of frivolous lawsuits going around. But here's the problem with that. A study actually showed, and ironically, this was a study that was trying to, uh, that was trying to demonstrate that frivolous lawsuits were a problem. They only found 12 examples, 12 people, who had done it more than 100 times, who had been in more than 100 lawsuits which gets to the point where they define as frivolous. 12 people in the entire country. So this is one way to start this week, calling congressional representatives and being advocates for those that need it. You all have come here because maybe you're one of my classmates and I offered you some points for it. <laughs> Maybe you saw the poster in the hallway and thought, huh, a social model of autism, what could that mean? Maybe I dragged you here because I wanted, uh, I wanted an audience. Either way, it starts with people willing to stand up. I'm an autistic. I'm proud of that. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't have it any other way. And there are a lot of people that have autism that might not feel that way. And that's unfortunate. But the way to get them to that point is not by telling them how they should feel. It's by celebrating who they are. Cannot thank you enough for coming. I would like to open. I would like to open up to questions now, but I cannot thank you enough for coming to this lecture. Uh, this is such a great turnout. I had no idea so many people would be here. So